Welcome to this episode of the Easel Grand Round series. My name is Mark Furs and I'm the head of the Division of Digestive Diseases at Imperial College in London and I'm head of the Clinical Service of Hepatology at St Mary's Hospital. Just a brief introduction to the hospital. Uh, it's one of the main uh, central London teaching hospitals and is renowned for a number of things uh, in its past. Um, it was the place where Fleming first discovered uh, penicillin in 1928. Waller uh, is a famous cardiologist and electrophysiologist who developed the ECG. Uh, Almuth Wright, he uh, was famous for his work in immunology, and Rodney Porter is also a famous alumni who discovered the structure of antibodies and was rewarded with a, a Nobel Prize. The hepatology unit was set up by Howard Thomas, uh, who was well renowned for his work on viral hepatitis and liver immunology, and moved to, the, um, to St. Mary's from the Royal Free Hospital, where he'd been working uh, with um, the famous Sheila Sherlock. So St. Mary's is known also uh, for, on the social side for its sporting achievements and its links with the royal family. On the sporting side, uh, many of you will remember uh, Roger Bannister, who was a neurologist at St. Mary's, who was the first man to break the four-minute mile, and J.P.R. Williams, who was a famous Welsh rugby player. And our links with the royal family go back many years, and all recent royal births have been uh, taken place at the Lindo wing, the private patient wing at St. Mary's, and many people will have seen St. Mary's through the eyes of the cameras uh, watching the birth of Prince George. So if I can now uh, introduce my colleagues uh, on my right, Amit Da, who is a consultant hepatologist at St. Mary's, and on my left, Ben Mullish, who is a research fellow in our unit. And I'll hand over to Ben to present our case. Thank you. So our case today is a, uh, a patient that we looked after in our unit for, uh, for some time, a 56-year-old man who's been under the care of the unit for, uh, for over 20 years, having first been diagnosed with chronic hepatitis B and delta infection, and delta infection at the age of 31. He's initially been treated with combination interferon and the ribavirin therapy at the age of 40, but unfortunately it's had uh, uh, unsuccessful treatment. And on subsequent follow-up, uh, underwent a liver biopsy in his early 40s, which confirmed cirrhosis. His only past medical history otherwise of note was thalassemia trait, with no personal or family history otherwise of any haematological disorders. The rest of his non-invasive liver screen, as apart from his viral hepatitis, was negative. So he was initially followed up in the clinic as our unit, um, and treated for his chronic hepatitis B with tenofovir, uh, treated successfully with a fully suppressed hepatitis B DNA, and underwent biannual um, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance. Unfortunately, he developed progressive decompensation, particularly with regards to complications of portal hypertension. A screening gastroscopy identified grade one esophageal varices, uh, for which he was started on non-selective beta blocker propranolol. And he also developed issues with ascites. He was treated initially with diuretics, first spironolactone, later frusamide, but this was limited particularly by treatment side effects and especially hyponatremia. In light of this, for the need for more definitive management of his ascites, he regularly attended the day unit and had a number of hospital admissions for large volume paracentesis in the unit. Unfortunately, it was also noted as well as the issues of portal hypertension, he was developing progressive synthetic failure uh, with an INR that rose to 1.3, an albumin that had fallen to uh, 28. And over the course of a couple of years, it was noticed his bilirubin had risen from near normal up to, um, up to 90. In light of these, uh, these issues, he was uh, assessed by scoring systems and found to have a MELD score of 16 and a UKELD score of 55. Both him and his family also noted a, uh, a more general deterioration, um, particularly noting weight loss, lethargy, and, uh, and failure uh, to, uh, to hold down full-time work in light, of his, um, in light of his progressive liver disease. He was assessed, therefore, for liver transplantation. Um, as part of his assessment, he underwent a repeat gastroscopy, which again showed grade one varices. 
It was felt he had no medical or surgical contraindications for transplant, and he was therefore accepted and listed. Of particular note, whilst on the waiting list, he still had um, regular hospital attendances, including uh, acute hospital admissions for management of his societies, uh, where he was treated with large volume paracentesis. And during all these hospital admissions, uh, he, he was not given uh, pro prophylaxis against venous, venous thromboembolism. Having been on the waiting list for a transplant for three months, he was called in because it was felt there was a, uh, uh, an organ that was suitable, but unfortunately the organ was unsuitable. But while he was uh, uh, attending hospital, the transplant assessment team also noted that he had a red, hot, swollen, tender left calf. And the Doppler confirmed the suspicions that this was a significant deep vein thrombosis. At that time, his hematological parameters were shown with a platelet count reduced to 143 an INR prolonged at 1.3, and a haemoglobin of 123. A thrombophilia screen was sent that subsequently came back as negative, and he also underwent a CT of his chest, abdomen and pelvis as an inpatient. This showed no other signs of thrombosis other than his deep vein thrombosis, and no obvious precipitant to the DVT, so there's no evidence of malignancy. Uh, the transplant assessment team decided to start him on low molecular weight heparin, uh, initially, before transferring him over to warfarin, aiming for a target INR of 2 to 3. The subsequent plan was that he would be followed up for his warfarin in the uh, anticoagulation clinic local to him, and that he was referred back to the uh, pre transplant clinic for further optimization prior to transplant. Uh, he was next seen by hepatology services in the pre transplant clinic one month later, and at that time had uh, markedly deteriorated. In particular, uh, both him and his partner had noted that he'd had a number of falls and that there'd been a number of episodes where he'd had uncoordinated movements. Urgent blood tests revealed that he had an INR of 14 and further assessment revealed that he had not been attending any of his follow-ups at the anticoagulation clinic. He was urgently admitted to hospital and underwent a CT brain. And here are two images, uh, two cross-sectional images from the CT of his brains. And obviously there's a very marked abnormality on the um, on the right side, an acute extra, extra axial hemorrhage with subarachnoid and subdural components with diffuse associated right cerebral hemisphere edema. And so marked was the hemorrhage and the edema that there is a um, significant mass effect. He was admitted therefore for observation and for decision on the definitive management of his brain hemorrhage. Uh, serial neuroimaging revealed no progression, no evolution of his, uh, of his hemorrhage. His coagulopathy was aggressively corrected. Um, and there was close liaison between hepatology and neurosurgery as to the, um, as to the best plan. Uh, fortunately, he had no further obvious neurocognitive deficits. The only concern there'd been were two tonic clonic seizures. The neurosurgeons decided to opt for conservative management and also to start him on phenytone for his seizures. Uh, of course, while he was under uh, care for his hemorrhage, he was suspended from the transplant waiting list. Unfortunately, he had a very stormy uh, subsequent hospital course. He developed a, a severe hospital-acquired pneumonia, shown in the um, chest X-ray at the top, despite um, six different courses of antimicrobials of, uh, of increasing potency. He still, uh, he still failed to respond, developing progressive respiratory failure and with progressive increase in his inflammatory markers. He developed evidence of uh, worsening uh, portal hypertension, he, uh, he, he had drainage-dependent loculated ascites and, and an episode of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. He then went on to undergo a varicell bleed. So of this time, he had been off anticoagulation for some time and also a worsening coagulopathy. He then went on to develop other more complex problems. Uh, one that was a particular concern was edema that occurred in his mesentery with progressive development of ileus as shown in the abdominal film at the bottom. And this was refractory to typical medical therapy, supplementing his electrolytes and a, uh, a, uh, a trial of neostigmine. Another concern was um, progressive sarcopenia, despite attempts at physical therapy and despite attempts at supplementing his nutrition with nasogastric or nasogeginal feed. This was a progressive problem and it was difficult to, uh, to mobilize him out of bed and to, um, uh, uh, and to put on weight. As such, he went, entered a somewhat of a downward spiral, underwent a progressive deterioration, and there was a decision between all those caring for him that he would be unsuitable for intensive care and would not be fit for liver transplantation. 
uh, was made, a uh, decision was made to not ascend his care beyond ward-based care, and then he passed away. So in summary, this was a 56-year-old man with chronic hepatitis B and Delta co-infection with associated child pupae cirrhosis. He had a number of hospital admissions for uh, management of his societies, during which he was not given VTE prophylaxis. He subsequently developed a deep vein thrombosis that had been treated with anticoagulation, first low molecular weight heparin and then warfarin. But unfortunately, he hadn't attended appointments at the anticoagulation clinic. Um, and as a consequence of that, developed a profound coagulopathy with 9R14 and developed an intracranial hemorrhage. This, after developing his intracranial hemorrhage, the key next um, uh, part of his hospital course was developing a severe hospital-acquired pneumonia, which precipitated further decompensation with portal hypertension, ileosarcopenia, um, and progressive, uh, a progressive multi-organ dysfunction, which led to his death. So there are a number of issues raised by this case um, uh, relating to his anticoagulation and relating to his care overall. First, um, uh, Dr. Dahl, the first thing that springs to mind is there was a common perception among many cl clinicians caring for people with, um, with cirrhosis that uh, uh, the coagulopathy associated with advanced chronic liver disease makes people auto-anticoagulated and that their risk of thrombosis is negligible. What are your thoughts about this? Is it surprising this man developed a thrombosis? As you correctly say, there's a historical belief in view of synthetic dysfunction that patients are auto-anticoagulated and that gives them a degree of protection against thrombosis. But the, uh, the recent evidence suggests that this is not the case. Um, and this is extrapolated from uh, cohort studies from uh, venous thromboembolic disease as well as our experience of splanchnic vein thrombosis in cirrhotics. So we look at the data uh, of the incidence of venous thrombo uh, thromboembolic disease, such as PE or DVTs. Well, there's, there's up to a 6% incidence of uh, venous thromboembolism within hospitalized cirrhotics. And uh, I'll bring our attention to this one study published in 2009 from Denmark, which was a large cohort study, which uh, evaluated the risk of thrombosis in cirrhotic patients. And it demonstrated that there was an increased relative risk of 1.7 in cirrhotics compared to non-cirrhotics when, uh, when, uh, when it came to developing thromboembolic disease. So there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that there's an increased, em uh, ev there's an increased um, incidence of thromboembolic disease in cirrhotic patients. Now, as we said, a prolonged INR does not give protection against thromboembolic disease, and that needs to be considered. And, um, and our, our view would be that when assessing risk of thromboembolic disease, uh, we should use the same parameters that we use in the general population. And I'll bring our attention to a recently uh, formulated score called, uh, called the Padua score, which has been validated in cirrhotics to this avail. If we look at our experience of uh, splanchnic vein thrombosis, including portal vein thrombosis, where well, we all are familiar with the increased incidence of portal vein thrombosis in decompensated cirrhosis. Uh, there's an incidence of thrombophilia in these patients, including prothrombin gene mutations and factor V line, and, and patients should be screened for those conditions. We also need to consider local factors such as post-operative changes, infection, and inflammatory changes. So, in summary to the question, I'm not surprised this gentleman developed the thrombosis um, in view of the evidence that is emerging that uh, cirrhosis and decompensate liver disease there's an increased evidence of venothromboembolic disease in these patients. Okay. One other issue that's sort of raised by this case that we've alluded to already was that he wasn't given any VTE prophylaxis. And we mentioned some of the issues regarding that, concerns about his low platelet count, his prolonged INR, um, uh, frequent need for large volume paracentesis. What are your comments on that? Should this man have received VTE prophylaxis during his emissions prior to his DVT? It's a difficult question. Um, there's limited uh, advice regarding uh, guidelines uh, to guide us uh, regarding this practice. Um, we do know that there's a much lower use of VT prophylaxis in hospitalised patients with chronic liver disease than those without, uh, and that probably uh, is borne out by a natural fear of giving anticoagulation to patients with chronic liver disease. 
Uh, the studies that have been published are slightly contradictory. That may relate to the fact that most are retrospective and there may be issues with the, the coding or the identification of patients with chronic liver disease. Uh, and we do need good prospective studies to uh, evaluate this further, um, to allow us to decide case by case whether there is a benefit to give venothromboembolic disease prophylaxis uh, to these patients. But I do want to bring our, um, I do want to highlight one study that was published recently, which did uh, demonstrate a decreased incidence of venothrombolic, uh, venothromboembolic disease in patients with chronic liver disease given prophylaxis with no increased risk of bleeding. And they did identify various factors that, um, that predispose patients to thrombosis, uh, including malignancy, um, trauma, surgery, and a previous history of venothromboembolic disease. So they, these things need to be considered when making that risk assessment. They also demonstrated that uh, having a prolonged INR, baseline INR, was not protective against development of uh, thrombosis and neither was the severity of the liver disease. So child C patients also developed, um, they demonstrated that child C patients also developed thromboembolic disease and there was a protective effect by giving uh, prophylaxis, prophylaxis in those patients. So uh, in summary to the question, I think the, we are not, there's limited data from guidelines and I would suggest that we use a case by case um, practice to that avail, we have recently published a, a proposed algorithm that uh, will be published in the Journal of Hepatology later this month, which, uh, and if we run through this very briefly, um, it defines patients by risk of thrombosis, dividing patients into low risk and high risk. Um, you stratify risk by using loads of protocols or pre-existing scoring systems such as the Padua prediction score. Uh, if patients are deemed low risk, you can consider mechanical VTE prophylaxis. If they're deemed high risk, uh, pharmacological prophylaxis, including anticoagulation, but taking into consideration the risk benefit of that. Um, uh, and I think uh, those guidelines, as I say, will be published uh, later this month in the journal Hepatology. Okay. Moving on, one other issue raised by this case, um, and something people frequently describe in practice, is a concern among, uh, among give, uh, about the safety of giving anticoagulation to people with chronic liver disease, uh, and particularly the concern about bleeding risk, especially if a patient's had bleeding complications before, such as gastrointestinal bleeding, particularly patients with varices. What's your views on this? How safe is anticoagulation in those with chronic liver disease? Well, as you say, there is a natural uh, tendency for people to be fearful of giving anticoagulation to patients with chronic liver disease. Um, and that may be borne out by um, the, their personal experiences. But if we, if we look at the data uh, in both phenothromboembolic disease and portal vein thrombosis, um, uh, hopefully that may clarify some of the concerns. If you look at venothromboembolic disease, well, there's limited data uh, to date uh, on safety and uh, efficacy in this scenario. Uh, and I think the main concern is what is the best way of monitoring patients who are on anticoagulation. But there are some recently published guidelines from EASL which suggest that we should aim to run an INR between two to three, but further prospective studies are required. If we look at portal vein thrombosis, I think the experience is, is more, uh, is larger. Um, we've got a good experience now uh, with various studies looking at uh, anticoagulation in this setting, including low molecular weight heparins and vitamin K antagonists, and they've been deemed, deemed as safe and efficacious um, in this setting. There is a small number of uh, bleeding complications, but I think if you adequately risk assess patients, uh, including uh, treat, uh, screening and treatment of viruses before um, starting anticoagulation, and there is good monitoring of anticoagulation um, during the therapy, this can be minimized. I think we have to take uh, the key point, I would say, when, when, when giving an anticoagulant in this setting, is to take into account the platelet count. If there is evidence of thrombocytopenia, in particular a platelet count less than 50, um, you know, there is the suggestion that the dose of low molecular weight heparin, that is the anticoagulation being used, should be reduced. So I would say, um, again, I think you know, th there is a fear of, uh, there is a natural fear 
of, to prescribe anticoagulation in these patients, but with good monitoring and, um, and uh, good screening of patients, uh, this can be minimised. Uh, so if we look at individual anticoagulation, uh, anticoagulants, um, you know, we, we do have some experience. If we look at unfractionated heparins, well, there's a feeling that cirrhotics are more sensitive to this type of anticoagulation. In particular, there can be a drop in haemoglobin independent of bleeding and thrombocytopenia due to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, so I'd probably say that, that would be my least favourable anticoagulant in this setting. We have more experience with low molecular weight heparins, as I said, in, in portal vein thrombosis, and they are deemed safe in patients with decompensated liver disease, as long as patients have been screened for viruses and had those viruses treated. Um, but again, I would say, as before, if you do place patients on low molecular weight heparins, they need to be monitored adequately. Yep. And then if we look at vitamin K antagonists, well, the, the smaller, there's a small evidence base. Uh, we do have some data uh, published in abstract form uh, from our group looking at anticoagulation in pre serotic patients and post-transplantation and there was no evidence that there was any safety concerns in those in those groups. So, uh, you know, summarising the, the answer to that question, I, I, I think generally anticoagulations, if prescribed and, and monitored adequately, are generally safe. Um, I would suggest that if patients are on low molecular weight heparins, that they are routinely monitored. If they're on a vitamin K antagonist, we aim for a target range two to three with good compliance to, to, to the, the dosing and, and regular monitoring. And if people do opt to uh, start an unfractionated heparin, then you know, again, I think they have to be aware of some of the concerns we have with that type of anticoagulant in this setting. And there has to be, again, regular follow-up aiming for an APT uh, being prolonged up between 1.5 to 2.5 above the normal range. Okay. And across medicine, there's an increasing use, increasing interest in novel anticoagulants, particularly the direct oral anticoagulants. What experience is there of their use in people with chronic liver disease? Uh, well, these are relatively new drugs, and the drugs we're talking about are uh, factor 10A inhibitors such as Voxaban or Pixaban, or the thrombin antagonists such as Dagabatrin. And in a similar vein to vitamin uh, K antagonists, there's limited data out there regarding their use in cirrhotics, and that partly relates to the fact that these are, are relatively new drugs. But I'll, I'll bring our attention to this one study published in 2000. 16, a small number of patients on, this, on these new drugs. The majority were on factor 10A inhibitors, but interestingly, there was no increased risk of bleeding noted, and there was no evidence of um, drug-induced liver injury, which is a concern, has been a concern with this class of drugs. So I think we need further, uh, as time, time passes, we'll have further experience of these drugs, larger studies, uh, and that will uh, guide us further. Okay. And thinking more broadly, there is some, lots of interest in the uh, in, in the literature about some uh, some 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 broader uh, benefits that may come from anticoagulation, other than purely preventing or, or treating thrombosis uh, in people with chronic liver disease. Could, could you give us uh, discuss that with us at all? Well, it's a good question, Ben. Um, our, our Professor Thurza's group has been involved uh, uh, over the years with looking at some of these added benefits, in particular the link between thrombosis and fibrosis. Um, epidemiological studies have suggested that thrombophilia, such as uh, factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene mutations, have been associated with more progressive fibrosis, in particular in hepatitis C. And animal studies have, 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 um, have validated uh, certainly the role of factor V Leiden in, 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 in more rapid fibrosis. Um, so um, it's an area that has been evolving. To take that on further, anticoagulation has resulted in an antifibrotic effect in animal models. And we've also, it's also been demonstrated that there's been a reduction in hepatic vascular resistance in uh, carbon tetrachloride treated mice. So I think, you know, there are some potential added benefits to, to anticoagulation. Uh, I would say, um, you know, these are, we're, we're not at the, this point in time uh, saying that patients should be placed on anticoagulation uh, for indications other than prophylaxis of thrombosis or treatment of thrombosis, though. Now, I think the main 
clinical study to date, uh, and most people will be familiar with this, is the study by Villa published in 2012 in which prophylactic dose of heparin was given to uh, cirrhotic patients for a period of two years, with the endpoints being uh, the incidence of portal vein thrombosis, decompensation, and survival. And the patients who were anticoagulated demonstrated not only a reduction in portal vein thrombosis, but a reduction in decompensation and an increase in survival. So this is this has uh, generated a lot of interest in some of the added benefits of anticoagulation in patients with cirrhosis. And if we draw in the, uh, the, the, the evidence from the previous slide, well, there may be a role in that in cirrhotics, anticoagulation not only prevents thrombosis, but also there's a, a reduction in fibrosis and reduce uh, hepatic resistance, which may then result in an improvement in decompensation and survival. Okay. But further studies are required. So to tie everything together, to probably answer the question that's most fundamental of all, to, to what extent do you think that anticoagulation contributed to this man's death? Well, I think if we, if we look at the case and, and then we draw in on some of the, the points we've discussed, I think the, um, you know, the main failure in this gentleman was was the, the, the failure for his anticoagulation to be monitored adequately. I don't, think the, the, I don't think any of us would suggest that he did not require anticoagulation for his indication. Um, the failure to be monitored adequately led to him to be profoundly coagulopathic, which then resulted in a significant bleeding event. This bleeding event then led to a hospital-acquired infection, which ultimately then resulted in his decline, deterioration, and death. So, so I think if we, this gentleman had been adequately monitored, um, this may have been prevented. Now, the other point one could make is, well, actually, if his VTE uh, risk-benefit profile had been defined before he had developed the thrombosis, and it was deemed that he should have had VTE prophylaxis, this also may have prevented this, the, the outcome. So I think the two important points are, yeah, um, I think if you are going to start somebody on anticoagulation, they need to be monitored correctly. And I think we need to be more acute of the, the need for VT prophylaxis in these patients. Thank you. Okay.